Hey everyone, Will Cooper here, host of Hunt Stand's Make Your Mark podcast. Join us as we dive deep into the world of hunting and outdoor pursuits. We've brought together some of the most accomplished individuals in the industry to share their invaluable insights and experiences with you. But here's the kicker. It's not just about hunting tips and tactics. We're exploring how you can carve your own path, elevate your skills, and gain some wisdom from the best in the field. So whether you're a seasoned hunter looking to fine-tune your skills or a newbie eager to learn, our podcast has something for everyone. Stay tuned for more exciting guests and hotter topics. Don't miss out and subscribe to Hunt Stand's Make Your Mark podcast today and start making your mark in the great outdoors. Every day when we're on the road, people around us endanger themselves and others by using their phones while driving. They think they're hiding it, but we've all seen them and know exactly who they are. For instance, there's a sneak a peeker who darts their eyes between the road and their text. There's also the got a ticketer looking upset because they just got a ticket for using their phone while driving. And what about the fast scroller who can't drive five minutes without updating their social media feeds or the night lighter who has that mysterious glow illuminating the inside of their car after dark. Do any of these sound familiar? If they remind you of yourself or someone you know, Rethink your behavior before you find yourself becoming the fender benderer, the veering off the rotor, or worst of all, the driver who killed someone. Put the phone away or pay. Paid for by NHTSA. Hello and welcome to the Publicly Challenged Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Oswald, and I hope you join me on my quest for knowledge to become a better public land hunter, angler, and forager. Stick with this and who knows, maybe we will learn something together. The guest on this episode is Brandon Waddell of Wilderness Attitude Podcast. And I have to say, he's uh, one of my favorite podcasts to listen to. So if you haven't listened to it, I definitely recommend it. I'm also excited. Um, he's taken a little bit of a hiatus and done some restructuring on his podcast. And he talks a little bit about it. Um, it sounds like a pretty interesting concept. And I can't wait to listen to the rest of the episode. So if you haven't heard of them, I'd say subscribe because it's going to be pretty good episodes when they do come out. Also, I mean, I, I wanted to talk mule deer and elk with him, being that he's a resident of Colorado, living in southern Colorado, and that's kind of where I did my first elk hunt. And I got to say, um, he definitely dropped some, some good knowledge and advice on this podcast, and it's something that anybody who's considering going on a first elk hunt or maybe... Uh, you know, even a second or something like that, that they really don't have a lot of experience. This is one that they'll want to check out. So without any further waiting, here it is. So I'm sitting here and I'm uh, talking to Brandon Waddell of Wilderness Attitude. And uh, before we get going, Brandon, I just want to say thank you for uh, for being on and taking time out of your schedule to talk to a guy like me and drop some knowledge on me. So if you don't mind, want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Brandon Waddell. I uh, live in Hesperus, Colorado. I'm a you know, business owner. I own a trucking company, so I truck by day and and uh, live by passion the rest of the time, right? Uh, I got a big family, married, uh, and I just I love the outdoors. I love sharing it. I love keeping people and encouraging people to have a great attitude. Uh, I think that the wilderness helps me attain that, hence why uh, – I have Wilderness Attitude podcast and the brand, and and then uh, I also uh, am the owner of Mountain Archery Fest um, that we started last year, and so that's a whole another extension of of fun. So that's pretty much sums okay. me up. <laughs> How far does the Mountain Archery Festival span? Does it, I mean, does it go all over? Is it pretty much Colorado based? Uh, we did Utah and Colorado last year. Um, in 2020, we're doing Idaho, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico. Um, and we'll just keep growing by an event or two each year. Uh, we'll be, we've been begged to come into Indiana, Wisconsin, um, and, uh, and let's see where else, Oklahoma. So we'll see where, how that, how that spreads out. Um, you know, mountain archery fest is one of those things where you got to be tactful in your growth and kind of work through it. But, 
Um, we've got some interesting stuff on our plate right now that we're working on that might actually explode us a little bit more than I'm <laughs> ready for, but, um, but that, that's okay. That's okay. We'll right, take it and run right. with it. Right. Yeah. Take why the not? blessings. So yeah. I'm just kind of wondering when you do, uh, elk and uh mule deer are you are you normally a guy that's building a lot of points and trying to apply or are you going for uh for just over the counter stuff mostly well i do both within colorado so um colorado up to this year has been an over the counter tag for elk um and but i can always put in a point for a point first in my application and then pick um my three choices beyond that uh so Typically, I put in for an elk point, and then I put in for like a late rifle tag or, you know, late cow rifle. It's basically all I put in for after that, to be honest, because I don't really want to jeopardize getting a different rifle tag. Um, that cow tag is a B tag. Um, up, well, until this year, it was a B tag. Now it's an A tag. Um, so I won't even be putting in for that. I'll be putting in for a point because eventually I'll have enough points that I can go into a quality unit. But in the meantime, I can still get an over-the-counter archery bull tag and still go out and archery elk every year. Um, on mule deer, uh, I put in – typically for mule deer, I, I've been putting in for the unit that I live in. Uh, I put in for a deer point, and then I try to get the unit I'm in, and then I try to get the unit above me and the unit next to me uh, because those are basically where I'm already going to be elk hunting. So, you know, I just kind of – morph what I'm going to do each year based on kind of how the draw works with me or against me. And, um, and I kind of go from there, uh, outside of the state of Colorado, I really haven't spent a lot of time building points in other States. Um, I kind of watch for the over the counter stuff that I want to go do. Um, and up till now I haven't done a lot of that. Uh, I just started in the last few years branching out and going out Would of state. that have anything to do with the large family? Yes, very much so. Um, getting getting time away uh, when you're raising nine kids is a difficult situation. Um, family time is extremely valuable. Each kid, my wife, they all need some of my time. Um, and that's really where um, that's something that over the last year, I really went kind of bonkers for a little while and kind of put everybody on the back burner and really threw myself in you know, in front of everybody. And I kind of got to a point where I felt like I deserved that. But, uh, but here recently in this last year, I realized that that was a little selfish of me and that there was some time that I needed to give back. Um, so I really, this year's hunting, it looked much different than the last 10 years. There's a lot more kids involved. Um, but it was still, um, well, you know, uh, yes and no. Um, over the years, you know, of, teaching kids to hunt and taking them out. Um, you know, I always took the time for myself and then it was always cool because I could always levy my kids' time, um, against my time with my wife, um, because I had to take them. Right. Um, and so, um, this year I spent some good time with Braxton. He's my 12 year old. So he just came of age to hunt. I spent some time with my 28 year old and my 16 year old, um, getting them out on trying to find some elk this year. So that was pretty cool. I got a couple children that are like mega backcountry kids, right. That'll do anything I ask of them, um, and go anywhere. Um, and then I've got some kids that aren't so much into the <laughs> 10 mile a day deal and they would just prefer for me to take them to some two mile locations and get them into the best that we can and, and try to provide them some opportunity. So, um, to answer your question, yeah, this year really changed more or less, not necessarily for kids, but more or less for me and my marriage and, um, and just some refocusing and rebalancing, um, of life. Okay. So. Okay. Um, is there any tips that you could give me? I mean, you know, I don't quite have quite as many kids as you, but I mean, any advice to find time or try and do it to make it, make it a little bit easier to get away or anything that you found? I think that if you, you know, in, it, it takes a little time um, to get away from a family, I think, especially in your scenario where you got a bunch of young children, uh, you know, five and under, three, five and under, that's a lot of work. Um, and when the majority of my kids were younger, my hunting was very little. Um, it had to be pretty strategic. It had to be well-placed. And so, you know, 
my recommendation recommendation to you at this point is is you know you're gonna have to lean on your single buddies you're gonna have to lean on some other family guys you're gonna have to lean on um you know your local pro shop or maybe an outfitter that's your friend to kind of give you some some chances right up your odds because you're not going to get to go scout you're not going to get to go spend as much time in the woods you're going to have to get out there you're going to have to immerse quickly and you have to be calculated and you may just have to shoot something that isn't maybe exactly what you're looking for right because you know um and just be a little bit more open to that idea because your your time in the woods is not as much as it's going to be someday and you know when you get older your and your kids are older then and they're easier to take care of, then you're going to have more time to do more extensive hunting and search for that trophy or for that particular look or that, you know, character that you're after. Um, so I think that, you know, it's all a balance, right? You got to, it, it's, it's not easy. I said, the other thing that can kind of help you out some a little bit is, is that you can, you can work on getting your kids in the same unit um, you know, that helps because then you're knocking out two birds with one stone, so to speak. Right. Um, like I mentioned before, it's not always easy. I got some kids that want to go and hire units and get in the Rocky mountains and go deep. And I got some that would just prefer to go around the 80 or 300 acres around here and see what their chances might give them. Um, so, uh, I think that that's my best advice is just leaning on the people. They get you, they understand. You know, you may even have some older hunters that their kids are already older. They get it. They know. Ask them. Just say, hey, man, you know, be just be honest and say, I don't have much time. I need a little help because I've got these younger kids and my wife's at home taking care of them. And, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that she's given me these four days in a row to leave and go camp and go do whatever or, you know, uh, and just try to get their help, you know, so you can just be a little bit quicker at it. I think. And then I think the other thing that comes to my mind is, is that. You know, kind of going to this year of hunting for me, um, I worked a little harder at scouting around my house to find a bull this year um, and worked on acquiring a good sized chunk of property that had a couple bulls on it. And that was literally three minutes from my house. OK, I mean, seriously, three <laughs> minutes away. I can't get them to come to my I can't get them to come to my property um, because I'm a little too close to a highway. But a quarter mile to half a mile from the highway in a few of these lower lingering canyons, they're there. So, so this year it was, you know, get up early, go make my play, try to get it done, get out of there while they bed, and then come home and go to work or help refinish cabinets that we worked on this year all through archery season. And then go back out at 3, 3 4 o'clock, try to pick them back up and try to make a move. Um, it, it doesn't up your success rate, I don't think, it, versus immersing yourself in and really like becoming one with one because you're checking into the wilderness and you're getting to the right speed, but then you got to step out and then you get in a different speed and then you got to check back in and try to do wilderness speed again, you know, get into the elk mind frame again. So it doesn't make it easy, but it's doable, yeah. right? So. I think that there's balances in that and just trying to morph how it looks and how it is. Right. I mean, you got to be willing to give and take. I mean, that's what you signed up for when you got married and that's what you signed up for when, when you decided that's to have right. children, right? It's a lot of, so, there's a lot of that I'm coming to realize even more than, and sometimes I actually have to kind of pull myself back and realize that, you know, okay, maybe that is a little bit selfish, maybe not apply for that tag. And that's kind of like this year, I, I only put in for one spot and if I drew it, it was one of them things that it was like, okay, I have to go if it's that unit. Otherwise I'm not even going to bother doing it. And that way I told the wife, I said, there's no way I'm going to get it. And I'm just letting you know. So I'll be around shotgun season. That's why I'm here right now. I'm doing a bathroom for her to try and keep her happy. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah. I'm in the midst of the same thing and you know, it was kind of the same gig, you know, um, it's it, but it feels good. It feels good. There's yep. reward in it, right? There's reward in in finding that balance and, and doing that, you know. And, um, you know, I hunting season seems very long to my wife because it I hunt every weekend and a few nights and, you know, and that can go on for five or six weeks. And then the kids rifle tags come into play and we're hunting every week. And, you know, so it can it can feel like it's three months long, even though 
really it's only four weeks for archery and a week here for first season and first for second rifle and one week for third, right? Yep. And four days for fourth. I mean, it's, it's not really that long, but it really feels that way to her. And so, um, you know, the other thing I was thinking about doing next year was, is rather than hunting every weekend and trying to get in and find something and get out is, is that rather than hunting every weekend and a bunch of evenings, I'm thinking about just basically blocking out that, muzzle loader season which is in the middle of archery here it's nine days and just saying i'm taking this nine and that is that that is my hunting for the season and i'm that way i i think i can have better success rate doing that and going in and really getting into the woods and getting to that speed and slowing down the brain slowing down the body and really immersing yourself in there and i so we'll see if that comes to fruition you might check back with me next year at this time see if that actually came (laughs) together if it were i know I've, <laughs> i I, tr- I try a lot of times to try and take a vacation during well or either pre-rut or rut for whitetail here in illinois and it's one of them things that sometimes it mm. works out sometimes it doesn't but i mean i find that like the first three days even i have a hard time just slowing myself down to where i can get myself in that hunt mode and go what exactly. am i doing why am i rushing i've got all day you know yeah you know, and, and, you know, and that's, that's the hard part, right? Is that when you're trying to dive in the woods and dive out, it's, it's, um, you're not the best you could be. You're, you're not the best hunter. And if you're not, the, if you're not the best hunter, then your odds of success dramatically decrease because it's hard enough as it is. Right. 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 So. so another question for you is, and when you're doing muley hunting, are you more of a high country guy or you're you like, uh, above tree line or, you know, high, what do they call them? A high country mule, mule deer out by you or what, what's your preference? Well, um, so it really depends on, like I mentioned earlier, kind of what tag I get given. Right. But ultimately, um, I'm not a very good above timberline mule deer stalker. I, I have, it's hard for me to have that patience. Um, I'm, it is something that's in the back of my mind that I need to take more seriously and try to do, but that does lend itself to needing more time, right? Um, finding high country mule deer above timberline are, are, it's, it's not easy. The stocks are hard. You're going to blow a handful before you get your, before you even get a shot. Um, you know, so for me, I haven't quite ventured into that. Um, as much as I've thought about in the last two or three years of wanting to do. Um, so for me, most of my mule deer hunting comes, you know, in the 9,000 foot range and down to where I'm at and it, you know, anywhere down to like 6,000 feet. Um, most of my luck with mule deer honestly has come in the unit I live in and most of it's private land. Um, you know, we have a lot of, uh, farm bucks down this way around where I live and they're a little bit more predictable. Um, they're, I feel they're a little easier to hunt, although nothing's easy to hunt. Um, but versus spot and stock above timberline. Yeah. Much easier. Right. Um, you know, and, in muleys down here, you can get away with ground hunting, uh, tree standing, you know, uh, you know, spot and stock and on these lower elevations is fun. I mean, I think probably one of the best, one of the best stocks I ever had was hunting some private farmland where they'd cut it, but they left all the high weed windrows along where the wheels run in the pivot and, you know, crawling through those for, you know, a quarter mile to get close to a buck that's, you know, feeding and, um, and trying to draw in that and get up out of it and make a, you know, a good ethical shot, uh, (laughs) <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> I don't know why I can't apply that to crawling through willows in the high country and do the same thing, but I haven't yet. <laughs> okay. So, um, I mean, cause I've so, seen, I guess mule deer are pretty much everywhere at every elevation then. Cause I mean, I, I know I've seen them driving through yeah. the, uh, through the Eastern plains of Colorado all the way up to 8,000 feet where I started out mm-hmm. hunting last year. And of course I didn't have a mule deer tag in my pocket. I had an elk tag. And it was one of those things we got up to like 13,000 feet or 12 and a half and there was still mule deer all over. 
So is that kind of, I mean, it's just oh, yeah. pretty much the luck of the draw for a unit or are you a guy that's putting time in e-scouting or boots on the ground or how does that normally work? So, I mean, I've got, you know, I've lived here quite a while, so I've got some honey holes basically and between me and three of my core buddies, um, you know, I'm really lucky that I've got one friend, um, Greg mom, who he, he scouts like you wouldn't believe. Um, I mean, he, he always goes to new areas. He'll pick four new areas every summer to go, to go look at boots on the ground. He'll map them. He'll eat, you know, he scout them first. He'll go hike in 12 miles to see a basin and see if there's any deer in it. Um, you know, that's just something he'll leave work a Friday night and wake up Saturday morning, glass it and hike out. Um, so I'm lucky that I have him to look for some of the high mountain stuff. Um, cause that's his forte. But for me, you know, living here long enough where I'm at for most of the hunting I do in Colorado, it's basically just knowing where I've been, what I've seen, mapping that on base map or Onyx or, you know, and just keeping track of what I've seen. Um, and, and, you know, every weekend I might go to a different location each weekend to hunt mule deer or elk. Um, going out of state, big time me scouting. Um, this last year drew a, a buck tag in Utah. Uh, four of us did, and we did a ton of e-scouting. None of us had ever been there. None of us were going to have the time to go there. Um, we put out some feelers with some people we knew in Utah that gave us some general ideas. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that I always tell people is go immerse yourself and be friendly to the to the locals, you know, two years ago we went antelope hunting. We're ha- we were struggling. We rolled into a, a bar, restaurant, hotel thing in this little tiny town. Sat down, started BSing, started talking, and before we knew it, the owner of this place was like, "Meet me here <laughs> at six tomorrow." And he had us on antelope. He had us on antelope wow. in half an hour, you know. And we'd spent two days driving 300 miles a day looking for antelope and hadn't seen one. Um, so same thing when we went to Utah, you know, we just, we came across a couple people and, you know, and, uh, I just think that if you're friendly, I mean, we had a couple people that were like, oh, you're out of staters. Yeah. See ya. We won't, right. we won't even talk to you, you know, but then there was a couple people that were like, yeah, they're around, man. Just, they're mostly up here. Don't look down the canyons, that kind of thing. And, and then, you know, the next morning we, you know, I missed a buck at 500 yards three times. And then my buddy Jason, I said, I'm, I'm out. He's like, I've got him. I said, shoot him. And he shot him. So I could have capitalized on that if I could shoot a rifle better, but I don't, I don't rifle hunt hardly at all, hardly ever. And so, um, I think as far as getting back to scouting, you've got to implement everything possible, right? You got to e-scout, you got to ask people, you got to get there, you got to figure it out. You know, um, even when we got there, we had great ideas of what we wanted in Utah and we got there and we didn't see nothing. We spent all day glass and never saw a, not a mule deer one. And then we made some different moves looking at Onyx and base map and trying to figure out where we wanted to be and how we're going to change it up. And we went up and we made some changes and we started finding deer. I think the biggest thing that mistake that people make once they get to the boots on the ground after they've done their e-scouting and after they've done some things is they try to force them to be there right so um look if there's no sign leave if there's no sign leave well, you know if you don't get into fresh sign hunting elk leave you know don't 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 you the poop's not going to come out of the ground and rubs aren't going to magically appear right i mean you, and if they're not answering you keep going you don't sit in a basin and howl all afternoon waiting for something to answer you back if they're not going to answer if they're going to answer they're going to answer you if they're not then they're not ready to play it's just keep going right so i think that that you got to implement all forms and you just got to be you got to have plan a b c and d and then and then just fast forward to z i think uh my biggest (laughs) my biggest problem was is we we tended to focus on pretty much one unit and we weren't seeing hardly any elk and we were their rifle so it was third i believe second or third rifle and it was, you could see the trails were tore up. All the mules have been there. They got quite a bit of snow. And then when we got there, it melted off. And it was just, I mean, everything was a mess. We had to hike around the edge of trails because all of everything was so torn up. And it was one of them things that we were looking for elk that were probably already drove out of there. Would you think that's something that's probably a mm-hmm. bad scenario to put yourself in without really realizing? Or 
I mean, that was your first time coming to Colorado yep. elk hunt, right? Um, so, I mean, you know, was it a bad situation to put yourself in? No. Did you learn something from it? Absolutely. So it wasn't a bad situation. Um, you know, now you know that if you hit, you know, some of those certain elevations in those later seasons, like if you're seeing mule train tracks, then you're an outfitter <laughs> hell, right? You're there. You, they, they've got 12 dudes that were there first season, second, you know, like, the, you know, they're, they've scoured that joint pretty well. So, you know, you're either going to have to go deeper and darker than anybody else is willing to, or sometimes when you see a line like between, let's say 8,000 and 10,000 feet, where it's just been murdered by mule train and just tons of, you know, no sign of elk, but just tons of sign of people, then you got to go above it. You got to go below it. Um, you know, that, that range that they're trying to hunt in, right? Because most, look, most of those guys that are doing the big mule pack trains and all that, the guides, most of the dudes that are coming there to hunt with those guys, they're not going to walk <laughs> very far. Yeah. Okay. No, seriously. They're not, they're, they're most of them, 95% of them are not prepared to hike a thousand feet up a mountain at 10,000 feet. Right. So, you've got to put yourself in the situation where you got to kind of figure out what that line was and elevation and you got to go above it or below it. And you got to figure out how to go or, or if you're going to stay in that, then you got to go to the deeper, darkest holes you possibly can find because most of those guys are going to be like, yeah, there's an elk down there. I'm not going down there. That's... I'm not dropping 800, 900 feet into that hole. You can forget right. it. Plus then you, you got to pack it out too. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, you do. Right. But you know, <clears throat> that's part of, that's part of Rocky Mountain success. You got to be willing to do what other people are not, especially in an area that gets hunted a ton over the counter by in staters and out of staters. And that just is the predicament right. you're in. Um, so I think that uh, not a bad, not a bad, not a bad thing, but something you need to learn yep. from, right? Yep. I've definitely taken away quite a few things from that trip. And hopefully I can apply those with some more knowledge gained as we go and see what happens. Cause I definitely want to go back. I mean, it's awesome out there. Why wouldn't I, even if, mm -hmm. even if I didn't get another one, just being out there and immersing myself in that place, it's just amazing that, you know, people have that in their backyard. It's one of those things. I mean, I'm a flatlander. There's no doubt about it. And I've got timber and some public land, but it's nothing. And that's almost kind of what got me on the whole the love of the public land is once you experience something like that, you're like, man, this is something you don't ever want to lose ever. It's just, it's, yeah. It's yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, we have a vast amount of public land in Colorado. We're extremely lucky. I mean, we have some access, uh, problems here and there, but reasonably you can, there, you can go anywhere. I mean, you, you know, you can get close on, in truck, you can get close and you ATVs and then you can, you can put your boots to the ground. And you, I mean, there are millions, millions and millions of millions of acres of public land that you can come and hunt. Right. And I agree with you. I can step out my door every day and look at the mighty San Juan mountains, man, that I hunt in every year. And they're just, it, they're gorgeous. They're amazing. I mean, you just, there's nothing like it. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to try to figure out how to get back <laughs> because, um, you know, next time you come back, we'll look at where you're going and we'll talk about what you're doing and, you know, we'll, we'll try to figure out if we can make some different game plans for you that might that work a little good. bit better. I know they're definitely pretty rugged. They're some of the most rugged mountains I've seen, <laughs> but we'll, uh, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, there's even the Weemanooch that's in between where I was at and where you were hunting. Um, that is, uh, I mean, there's people that hunt Alaska and hunt the Weemanooch and they're like, they're like sisters to each other. I mean, the Weemanooch here in Southwest Colorado is legit. I mean, it's crazy, rugged, steep and, and insane. Like you could, I don't know, <laughs> that, you, you, you die over there. Like, I mean, you, there's places there where you're going, where you make the wrong step and it's over. Right. It's just, maybe I'll try and stay legit. out of those. <laughs> Well, I think that the Weemanooch is just one of those things you just got to know. You got to learn. Um, it takes time. You got to go explore it a little bit. People can tell you this, tell you that, but until you're in it, you really don't know what you're getting yourself into. Um, but it's 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 a good time in there. The animals are there. 
that's something I can tell you. I mean, you got everything from sheep and goat and moose and elk and deer. I mean, that that, that is the main that's the main point of that holds a lot of our you know top five big game animals in the state of Colorado in there. How so, does it work um, as far as uh, like over the counter mule deer tags? Are those say like I know some units you can buy an elk tag and then you can actually get a mule deer tag too, or is that just kind of depends on what's going on there? So. Th- yeah, there's there's very few units like that that I'm aware of, and most of them are on the plains, um, on the eastern plains that you can. That, but most, from what I understand in Colorado, most mule deer tags are through the draw. Um, they're not easy to get over the counter. The one thing you can get is you, very easily is a bear tag. Um, you have to have a big game tag in a unit to get a bear tag. But right now, Colorado is overrun with bears, so they're you know they're they're giving bear tags pretty darn cheap to out of staters and residents. Um, they really want you to have that tag in your pocket as an opportunistic tag or as a primary hunting tag. Right. So, um, that mule deer is not as easy to get on here. Um, it takes some points to get mule deer where you want, like to get into some of the high elevation, good mule deer units. I mean, it's going to take you, you know, it could take you three to seven points. Quite a few. Um, You know, um, it takes me two points to get one just where I live. So typically I can only draw a mule deer tag even in the unit where I live every other year and I'm a resident. So if, if, uh, a beginner was going to go and go for a tag, would you say go for an archery tag, go for a rifle tag? What would you recommend? And I mean, you know, not being around mule deer. Well, I think, I. I think as a beginner, I think, you know, uh, a, a rifle tag gives you better odds, right? Obviously, um, than an archery tag. So I would, I'd say a beginner rifle tag for sure. Um, and I would be, you know, you want to up your odds some more then you get closer to the rut. Right. Um, but, uh, draw tags in third and fourth season are harder to come by. Um, you know, they, there's a lot less of them to be had, so if you can get a third or fourth season, preferably if you can get a fourth season mule deer tag, that's money. I mean, that's, you're, you're going to get, if we have good snow, you're going to get transitioning bucks off the mountains that are coming down rutting. You're going to get the bucks of, you know, the lower land bucks that have been hiding like crazy. They come out of the woodwork. I mean, you know, even around here, um, where I live, I keep pretty good track of what's around here. And still every year in fourth season, I'm like, where did he come <laughs> from? Like, I've never seen him. And, and sometimes you get a hand, you get some mule deer that'll, that'll already start their, um, transition coming down. Um, but typically most don't. So sometimes you kind of feel like that they've just been hiding in the Canyon all summer and just, have never shown themselves. They've stayed nocturnal. Um, some of them big dudes, man, they, that's what they do. You'll never see them in the daylight. They'll stay nocturnal. And then finally, once a doe in the, you know, this part of the world goes nuts, then suddenly he comes out to play, you know, and now you're finally getting the first trail cam of him in the daylight, right? It's no different than whitetail, right? I mean, um, from what I understand, I mean, you got some big dudes that they just stay nocturnal yeah, until yeah, the rut that's, happens. That's pretty accurate. I mean, you might be able to catch them if you're if you're playing it right, or you can pattern them when they're still running in bachelor groups or something. But I haven't really been so successful with that yet. But yeah, you get you get some random stuff during the rut that comes out that yeah I've never even seen before. Who knows? It could have been on a neighbor neighboring property hunkered down the whole time, and it comes over. Never had a shot at one. Mm-hmm. I've never killed a big big deer, but something I'm working on. It's definitely something I'm working on. Yeah, the the big. The biggest mule I ever shot to date, um, dry score in velvet. He was 174 um, with a bow. And, you know, I had him on trail camera for months at, in the dark and just watching him grow. And, he, and he'd and he been around the property for about three years. We had, we had played chess for a few years prior, and he always won. Um, he was a super smart buck. And, in fact, the year that I got him, he was regressing. Um, he was an older dude and, um, but anyway, then I went out and sat like the second day of opening weekend off the corner of my property just because, well, the night before we'd had our shot cotton trap barbecue where we cook up like 
10 different things, have about 50 to 60 people over here. And we, I chef it up for them because I was a chef for quite some time in my life before I became a trucker. And so anyway, we opened up Moonshine that night. So the next day I was just kind of working, uh, nursing my brain a little bit. And I decided my wife went and got some Chinese and I ate a little Chinese. And I thought, well, I'm just going to go sit in the blind just because I need to get away. I just need to go relax. And I literally was falling asleep and I heard this boom, 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 boom. And I kind of sat up and I looked out my blind and I'll be damned if he's not there in daylight, 20 yards in front of me. I couldn't <laughs> believe it, you know? So yeah, right. you never know, right? Sometimes they stayed in nocturnal forever and ever. And that's how he got that big. And sometimes they, you know, what's so, the luck? What's the luck? Good. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't really stumbled on too much of that <laughs> on public yet, but so far, anything that I've done, I want to believe that it's because I actually put the work in because I've had, I, I came from hunting private and just went into public recently. You know, the past two years has been my primary mm-hmm. focus of, you know, whitetail hunting and I had a tough go at it. There was a lot of lessons learned as far as, you know, you hunt when people aren't out, other people aren't going to hunt, you know, or it, it's one of them yeah. things where you want to give yourself every single advantage you can. And I wasn't used to that. I was like, oh, I'm going to wait till the wind's right. I'm going to wait until, you know, the temp's a little bit cooler. I don't want to sit in bugs. I don't want to do that. <laughs> and and then I started realizing I'm never going to get a deer if I don't start doing that. So yeah, what's well, one of That's them. Right. Things. Yeah. It, it goes, it goes back to the same thing I mentioned earlier about, you know, go dropping into that Canyon to find that elk. Right. I mean, there's no one wants to go in there. The average Joe doesn't want to drop down in that hole, you know? And so it's the same thing, you know, and I'm the same way. There's days where I'm like, you can't kill nothing sitting here on the couch. And if you think about how many people are fair weather hunters, you're absolutely right. You got to go, you got to go when it sucks because that's when the opportunity yep. is. Right. So when you're scouting, uh, like on a unit, what, is there certain terrain features that you're looking for when you're targeting, you know, deer or, or are you looking for feed or some type of habitat or all of the above? All of the above. I mean, you know, uh, for mule deer, I mean, you're looking, you're looking for, you know, it, it depends between up high and down low, right? Down low, you're looking for a water source. You're looking for a transition area bedding, just like you guys do with, whitetail you know there's um your food sources and you know they tend to make a triangle in a sense instead of sometimes just straight lines um and so i look for some of that and i and i i kind of look at you know where county roads are where highways are like i'm always trying to find something because most of the animal the mule deer around here they'll cross that stuff but your good bucks stay away from most human organization right they they just they don't want to be around it really. I mean, there's some exceptions, but the majority don't, um, up high, you know, like up high, we're looking for willows and alders and we're looking for, you know, the stuff they like to bed in the stuff they like to eat. Um, and cause them high country mule deer, they won't go far at all. I mean, they'll go basin to basin, but for the most part, you're always going to find them in the alders. You're always going to find them those willows you're you know and and most of those high country positions you got streams coming down every you know everywhere there's just natural springs everywhere so you just got to look for their bedding zone and what they're eating not necessarily water but down low water is a key component um you know because it's drier more arid kind of scenario with elk here um it changes through the season and it also depends on the summer um, if we had great snowpack the winter before, then there's water everywhere, right? So at that point, I'm looking for the coldest place possible that them elk could hide in and bed in. Um, and then trying to find where that next food, where the food source would be from that coldest, darkest spot in the, in, in the pines, right? And, um, uh, because at that point they can find water anywhere, just like the mule deer up high. Um, you're looking for good feed, but you're looking for the darkest holes, and that's you're looking for if there's a possibility to get into that transition zones. Uh, you know, based on updrafts, downdrafts, and the thermals, and um, and just kind of you know how that's positioned in mostly our west southwest wind that we have here. Um, so it changes from time to time. Now opening weekend, opening weekend for elk, I'm one of those guys where I'll sit water. Um, I'll sit water because elk are on their summer 
program still. They're still they're still doing the same thing. They're they're bedding down all day in the darkest spot they can, and the first thing they're going to do when they get out of that dark spot is go to water. Period. That's the first thing they're going to do. Um, and so usually opening weekend, I find good success sitting on water. So I'll set a tree stand on a on a on a pond or a tree stand on a wallow or, um, you know, something, if I find a, a stream that's getting crossed hard, then I'll put a tree stand in them. And that's the key thing too, is here is if you can learn some good areas here in Colorado, when you come back, I mean, that's something I tell you, elk don't look up. <laughs> yeah. Unless they've been conditioned, right? They don't look up. They're, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. They're not educated to like whitetail are, and they don't look up. Um, so it's super awesome to, it's a, a, such an amazing advantage to hunt elk out of a tree stand. Um, not always practical, but if it's possible, buy a climber and, you know, if you find a kick-ass spot, climb it, and it's a good opportunity. Um, then later as we're working in, you know, to the season, I mean, your tactics change a little bit as, you know, when the rut starts. Um, then it's just a matter of just running ridge lines, bugling into canyons, getting one to respond figuring out what's the best play, getting lateral on them, getting whatever, making it work, make it play the best you can. Um, you know, I'll run five miles, 10 miles in and never hear a bugle. I'll go in and I'm out and then I'll get in the truck. I'll go to where I want to be the next day. I'll stay in the truck that night and I'll get up at three o'clock, work my way in, run a ridge line for eight to 10 miles. And, you know, I just, I can cover a lot more country doing that, running a bivy sack and running really light and just blowing and going and vent somewhere in there, you're going to find a bull that wants to play. And, you know, and that's when you make your, that's when you so go for it. When you, you mentioned so. that you, you sleep in the truck and you get out at three and you're hiking in or going up or whatever, heading up that, that rim. Uh, when you do that, is it one of them things that you don't want to go too high in elevation or something like that, because then your thermals are going to be dropping back down or how, how do you plan that and play that? Yeah. So I'll get up into a position where I think is good coming out of the truck, you know, off the trail and get myself in a position where as I'm working in the morning, I'm obviously, you're right. The thermals are going to be dropping downhill, right? So I'm going to work my way up through those trail systems or up a ridge point And you know, that might have where if I call off, you know, even though there's some thermal east west and you might have a southwest wind, you know, I'm going to try to work. And if I hear something down there, I'll drop back down, come in lateral, you know, so that my winds run in parallel. Um, but, you know, typically when you're blowing and going and making transitions like that and staying in the truck, getting up at three, trying to work in, um, they're not nearly as sensitive, in my opinion, in the dark as they are once it's light and they know that's the time when hunters are there typically. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've went in at night, found elk below me with my wind blowing right at them. I've stayed the night there, got up in the morning and they're still there, you know? So, um, gosh, you never know. And then there's times you go up and you, they, you bugle once they, they know you're there and they're gone. They never say a word. Right. So, um, I think that my favorite thing to do is just really to go find a connection system ridge wise where I can do about eight miles this way, eight miles to the West, eight miles back up to the North. And, and I just bivy in between, you know, each night I just bivy through there. Once I find elk, um, then that's, you know, then I'll just bivy in and I'll stay in that drainage. I'll stay near it. I'll work on how I'm going to do that. Um, just depends on where they're at. I mean, cause every day, I mean, yeah, you got the thermals are predictable, but every day the wind's different. So, yeah. So if, if you're, uh, if you're staying there with, with the elk and they're in the drainage, you want to be on like the other side of the drainage or what do you, you know, you don't want to blow them out. Right. Right. So, I mean, I'll hike all the way back down and around and come up the other side, you know, say if I got a westerly wind and they're in that west drainage coming off of a, you know, a north slope, then I'll, I'll go back up and around and go stay the night on the east side of them, knowing that if any change, typically around here, you can tell that the wind's either going to stay out of the west or it's going to turn to the north in the night. Um, so, uh, so as long as you're on that east side and you've, you've given them some distance, it works pretty good. Um, I've slept hundred yards from, you know, a, a group of elk to the east and it was plenty of distance. Um, and it's worked, you know, cause I'm already in there. I'm already in there, you know, I'm already in their neighborhood when I wake up. 
So I can hear them bugling and chirping all night long. And then the minute you wake up, it's game on. I mean, you just got to be super quiet and just kind of do your thing and just try to stay, you know, to that side. But even then you could stay on that east side. But if you drop down in the basin, let's say you drop down that bowl, even if you are to the east, you're going to swirl. Okay. Right. So you got to get you got to crest over the top of that to the east. You can't just be to the east. Right. You need to get out of that basin area or at least over into another where you got a draw and you got another draw and another draw within a basin. At least get a draw or two over, you know, to, so that they're not, it's not going to swirl. And then base and, and then don't and then even if they're even if the wind's going on that way, you're staying to the east, you know, take into consideration that if their food source is to the east, then you're screwed. Yep. Right. Because they're going to in the night, they're going to move to that food source and they're going to graze all night and they're going to walk right through you. And then they're and they're not coming back if they wind you over there. So, you know, it's all about just kind of figuring out. I mean, every lay is every lay each night is a different scenario. Um, but I think that, yeah, keeping keeping the wind in your favor, knowing watching what the wind does. I mean, there's so many apps now, right, where you can you can pick an area and make it a spot and you can watch the wind. Even before you come to Colorado, you could you could say this looks like a good spot. Well, I'm going to watch the weather. I'm going to watch the wind directions in that basin or off that ridge point. Um, you know, I like to use Antler Insanity app uh, and. And I can watch what that's doing through the night. I've never even um, heard of that. <laughs> you know, what's it's Antler Insanity. Yeah, an, Antler Insanity. Yeah, uh, a great. It's a it's a great app that does great wind. Um, I'll be honest. I mean, it's ninety eight percent accurate. It's a fantastic app. Um, you can basically put, you know. You can pinpoint places and you can name it and you can, you know, is it a tree stand? Is it a blind? Is it a pond? Is it whatever? And there's times where I'll like set my alarm, wake up at midnight and I'll go through my list and look at what each one of them's doing. And then at 4, 30, 5 o'clock in the morning, I'll go through and look at what each one's doing. And then as I'm on the road going somewhere where I've decided to go, I've got it open and I'm watching what it's doing. And then when I get there, I'm looking at it and then I'm doing my own wind checker and I'm saying, yep, it's right. Yeah. You know? And so I use it to game plan approaches uh, and things like that. And it works really well. So there's no real scent control, obviously, when you're staying out there like that. Then it's just pretty much straight up playing the wind, right? Would that be? Yeah. I mean, look, you know, yeah, there's, it's not the same as what you whitetail hunters have to do. It's not even close. I mean, you know, heck, I've, I've walked across a pasture and had elk walk across the line, you know, where, you know, in some instances, man, that would never fly. <laughs> no. Right. But I mean, you're trying, you're trying to mitigate your scent the best you can. I mean, you know, I'm wearing base layer, you know, Merino base layers, you know, in the evening and, you know, you try, right. You know, I wipe myself down in the tent every night, you know, when I get back and just simple things like that. But ultimately, no, you're 99%. You're playing the wind. Every setup you make has to be right with the wind, you know, or else, you're not going to get the opportunity. Okay. That makes sense too. So, um, what would you like for a state? Would you recommend Colorado for a beginner or would you tell them to go somewhere else just to higher percentage odds or something that you've noticed or seen or crowding or anything like that? I think that there's lots of apps now that you can look into that help you figure out odds and percentages and different things like that. And I think they're all useful, um, especially for a beginner. I think if you're trying to build confidence and self-esteem and, you know, just trying to get your first animal on the ground. I mean, even when I was elk hunting, it took me four years to get my first elk. And what's stupid is, is that probably the second year I could have had my first elk, but I just didn't think that I could make the shot. Well, you know, I can look back on some of that stuff and think that I could have I know I could have, I know I could have made the shot, but I was just, I didn't believe in myself and the, and the capability that I had. Um, so I think that searching some of that stuff out is important. Um, my favorite state for good odds. I mean, it depends on what you're after, right? And it also depends on what your price point is on what you're willing to spend to get a tag. Um, you know, I think that that's something for me that I, even now I look at still is the financial tip and aspect of it right but let's say you have no mo- you have no money restrictions and <laughs> i don't know who, who the, there are some people like that but i don't know who, i don't know there are any of our <laughs> right. listeners right but um you know but if uh you know i think colorado is a great state to get you know a bullet wet 
or an Arrowette. Um, I think that there's lots of opportunity here. I think there's lots of land, lots of public land to get lost in and to find animals. And, you know, we have a, we have a decent amount of count of elk and deer here, um, and bear. I think that, so I think that there's a good opportunity here, especially if you're looking to try to hunt all three at the same time, I think it's awesome place to be. Um, you know, looking at New Mexico and Arizona, I mean, if you're looking for trophy elk, then that's the place to be. Colorado is not a quality state right now. It's more of a high numbers, uh, you know, it's more yeah. of a quantity. Yeah. High, it's quantity state rather than quality. <laughs> although they're getting ready to start changing some of that for us. Like even here in Colorado in the Southwest corner, they're going to archery elk is going over, the, is going to the draw because our E31, 33 herds and some of these others are not doing good. Um, so they're trying to get ahead of that, but they're a little bit, unfortunately they're a little behind the, behind the game. But, um, you know, and then you're talking about big muleys, man. I go to yeah. Utah into some of those, but you're talking, but you're talking 10 point units. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, when you, when you think Colorado for a draw tag, being able to get in a unit, I mean, you got every chance to shoot, you know, 150, 160 buck and you got a chance to shoot a 220 buck. You know, I mean, it's just, you never yeah. know. Plus you Colorado's actually so, <laughs> closest um, for me too. You know, it's one of them things where I'm, I'll be driving right. 20, well, 23 hours to try and get to Arizona or something like that when, you know, 16 right into Colorado. So, right. Well, in Colorado, you know, is still the cheapest over the counter tags in the Western states, right? Um, as of 2019, they are. So, you know, for, for grabbing an elk tag, it's the cheapest, closest to most of you in the East. Um, so I think it makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That's, <clears throat> I don't know if I actually have any more questions though <laughs> for you. I think I kind of, you really covered them all. <laughs> so, well, I think, yeah, I think if you're looking to come out, you know, come out West, I think the biggest thing is to, um, really, you, you gotta be in shape. You, you better be ready. Um, I suggest that you, um, do a bunch of hit workouts. You get, you get your heart rate up. You really work your lungs, work your muscles, get yourself, drink a ton of water before you come drink a ton of water. When you first get here, um, you know, uh, there's a cool product that wilderness athlete makes and it's called altitude advantage. And I'd recommend that to any flatlander before they come here, you start taking it a week ahead of time. And it is amazing. I mean, even a week before, if I know that I'm going to be hunting at 11,000, 12,000 feet, even I take it. I mean, because I live at, you know, 7,300 feet. Um, and so you guys coming from a thousand or less, man, uh, I mean, that stuff works. So, um, I think that's a, that's something to think about. Um, I think the other thing is you're coming out here, just you, you got to be prepared for all the weather, right? So don't be afraid to bring a little extra gear. Don't be afraid to bring some, you know, some extra stuff and leave it in the truck. Um, you know, if things get real in August, it can snow yeah. and just hightail it back to the truck and re-outfit yourself and just be prepared because there's too many people that come. Well, and I'm I'm talking about archery, right? But in in rifle, yeah, just be prepared, man. Be prepared for the snow. Be you know when you come, make sure you got good tires. Man. It's not just about your gear; it's also about the vehicle you're bringing here, yeah. right? You know, make sure everything's in good shape and you're ready to go. Um, and I think that uh, you can have you can have success when you when you at least you're prepared, right? Be a good boy. Definitely, scout, right? definitely something to to do. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, I mean I even went out and bought an extra tire for my truck, so I had two full size spares and learned that I couldn't put chains on my tires. I had to put cables, those new kind of cables, because most newer trucks don't let you put chains on them. There's a bunch of things. <laughs> I actually learned more before I went yeah. out and, uh, you know, of course, learned a ton when I was there, too. It's just one of them things that I don't, I don't know if you could really ever be fully prepared, but at least you could have an idea until you get there and get in it, right? That's right. Yep. I mean, it, and I just think that, I, I just think that one of the most important things is just to be physically ready to come to this altitude, being physically ready to come here and face some of these mountains and these climbs and the altitude is a key component because, um, it, so often I see people show up here and then their hunts cut short because they get altitude sickness. 
Um, they, you know, I, I was following this other guy that came here, was hunting up by Grand Junction, and he came out of Missouri, and he came here, and he was two days in. He shot an elk, and they're packing it out, and he's like literally getting so sick packing his elk out that he made it to the truck and then they his buddy had to drive him to the hospital and they got him there and they were like holy crap like you're you're not good at all like you're you're if you he's like well i was gonna go back in and get another load they're like you would have died wow. on your next load out you would have died you didn't have enough oxygen going in your body at all like you were starting to you know get to the point where your limbs are breaking down and your organs were going to start going next and it was just you know so you just got to take care of yourself before you come. That's my biggest advice to coming yeah. out west. You know, shooting at shooting at something is just shooting at something, right? Being being having your equipment ready and gear ready and all that stuff is one thing, but just being physically ready because once you physically break down, then you're mentally going to break down, and then once that happens, so it's over. You're just can we it's talk over. a little bit more about that about the shooting and stuff like that? So yeah. When you're shooting, I mean, obviously, most of the shots that somebody in Illinois or something like that, like me, that's going to take in the Midwest, I mean, if you're in timber or anything like that, typically it's like 35 yards is what you're going to get. I mean, you practice out to 40 or 50, maybe. Mm-hmm. What what should you be doing to get out right. west and, and practice for a shot? Well, you got it. I would highly suggest that you're you're working on shooting further than that. I mean, you know, you should be practicing at a hundred yards, 90, 80. Um, you should be practicing at those long distances. Um, not that I'm going to encourage you to make a, that kind of shot, but practicing further, longer distances like that, it brings your effective range a little further out. Um, and then what I can tell you is, is that, you know, if you can put nine out of 10 arrows in an eight inch pie plate, then that's probably an effective range. It will, as soon as you step out of getting, let's change that number. As soon as you step out of getting 50% of your arrows into that eight inch pie plate, then take that, let's say you're at 70 yards, then cut it in half because really your effective range is 35. Right. And then if you're elk hunting, make it a 12 inch pie plate instead of an eight. And as soon as you're getting 50% of your arrows aren't getting in there, take that, whatever that is, maybe that's 70 or maybe that's 100 yards. Now your effective range is really 50 because you're going to have to cut your effective range down by 50% because you're just standing there, perfect conditions, making your shot. You got all the time in the world, blah, blah, blah. Right. So cut it down in half and that's going to be your real life heart pounding out of your chest, 10 mile an hour crosswind, and you're kneeling on one knee or you're shooting down, you know, shooting downhill or uphill. And that's going to create your real scenario is making that effective range about half, half the distance. If all you're shooting all the time is 45, you might be lights out at 45. It's great. I mean, you might stack arrows in a two inch group at 45 all day, but when you get here and you're depleted in oxygen and your de- your muscles are depleted and you don't have you don't have the same back control you don't have the same uphold you don't you're gonna you're gonna drop out of your shot you, there's so many factors change when you don't have the amount of oxygen and the amount of you know um, physical ability then it's gonna change your effective range probably it from 45 went down to 20 28 30 you know. And it's, it's going to be tough. Right. And then of course, and then the other thing I think, um, practice shooting, standing, kneeling, one leg out in front on one knee, sitting on your butt. Um, you know, cause when you're hunting elk and spotting, stalking and calling and doing that kind of stuff in the mountains, there is no flat. There's nothing flat about the Rocky mountains. So, you know, Practice shooting off of a hill. Practice shooting, standing uphill, shooting up a hill. Like, you know, do you put one leg down lower and are you better that way? Are you, you know, and then a lot of things too is is learning to draw with the horizon and then tilting at the waist down like you would, you know, out of a tree stand, right? It's the same concept, but your feet are on the ground, so you're not on a level platform. So it changes that ergonom- the ergonomics of that, of that tilt and that shot, right? So, um, you know, I tell people all just practice all those different positions. And then before you come out, get in the gear, you're going to hunt and for a week, shoot out of that gear, 
make sure make sure that if your range finder is here your binos are here or your sleeve make sure make sure everything's clear make sure everything's good in all of these positions right make sure that you're intact and um and, and i just think that that's super important before you come from the flat land up to the mountains so Say you're hunting mule deer or you're hunting uh, elk. Are you changing your setup at all, or are you shooting the same setup on your bow? I shoot the same setup, um, but I would highly encourage those of you that whitetail hunt to probably step it up. I mean, I think you're going to want a heavier grain arrow. Um, you're probably going to want a little bit more FOC. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I know some guys that whitetail hunt with some pretty heavy stuff because it's quieter, um, but typically you guys are shooting for speed more or less. Um, it seems like that's kind of my take, but, um, for me between elk and deer, there is no change. Um, I, I get my setup going in about May. I'll have my setup for the year dialed in. I have, you know, a couple dozen of those arrows built and I don't change a thing. Nothing changes you, all uh, summer. My draw weight. Are you tuning your arrows and all that kind of stuff too? you with your broadheads and yeah, I pay, pay paper tune every arrow um, and then I spend a lot of time shooting through paper. Once, once my bow is paper tuned and all my arrows are paper tuned, um, I spend a ton of time shooting through paper cause in all those different positions, um, because it, it'll show you how it changes, how you torque and how you don't level and, and different things of that nature. And then absolutely, um, I don't switch broadheads often ever. So typically I will put some broadheads in those arrow. So, and I end up picking my top six. So I'll take two or three dozen arrows and I'll end up picking my top six. They're all numbered. They're all flighted. I shoot them, shoot them, shoot them, shoot them. And I end up with my top five, top six arrows. Then those are my hunting arrows for the season. Um, they never fly off. They're always perfect with the broadhead with the, you know, they're always money. And then I always pick those and those are what I fly with for the whole season. Even if I'm down to, um, even let's say I shoot an elk, I shoot a bear, I sh you know, if, if I'm down to three arrows left out of that six, that's all <laughs> I carry because those are my killer arrows, right? And um, and then I just always have one, my sixth one's usually always with a judo tip, right? So I always carry, um, you know, in the field, I carry four or five with blades and I carry one judo tip because um, you might get the chance at a grouse or the other main thing is, is that, you know, you can hike around for a month hunting and you never shoot. Yeah. You don't, you shoot all summer and then you never shoot. Right. Um, and so while we're out cruising around and if we're in a spot where we know we don't have any animals around, we'll pick something to shoot at and we'll, we'll all shoot at it. Right. And we'll shoot two or three times a day with our judo tip just so that we're there just so we're kind of right. in the, we're, you know, we've done it. Um, because yeah, I mean, there's, it used to be, I would go out, I'd be set to go opening weekend and I literally wouldn't fire an arrow all month unless until the first time I drew on killing something. And that's kind of always dawned on me is that's kind of yeah. dumb. <laughs> I mean, I spend all summers being in tune, being in tune shooting, and then I don't shoot yep. all month. You know, it's like, no. yeah, silly. So I think that, I, I agree. That's um, a good thing to do. I kind of, I, I went through about, so I got a new bow this year, started shooting it, doing okay, got everything tuned. Then I started stepping it out. And as I was stepping in and out, I uh, started, it was a new release too. And I guess I didn't really pay much attention to the release when I bought it because it was garbage. And so I never even realized mm -hmm. that it had a real heavy, long trigger pull. You could lighten the weight, but it was still a super long pull. Right. There was a lot of take up in it. And so as I started getting further out, right. started messing up my shots because then I started punching the trigger. Then I yep. got at a huge, huge bout mm -hmm. of target panic. I mean, I was missing my 3Ds at 30 and 40 yards. It got that bad. I mean, it got in my head. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So then I'm like, all right, what do I do? So I went to the archery shop, started playing around with a couple different releases and stuff like that. Well, then I got a thumb release. And I said, maybe I want to try shooting back tension. The guy goes, you've got like two weeks before your hunting season opens. He's like, do you really think it's a good idea to be switching something <laughs> up like that? And I'm like, no, it's probably not. But guess what? If I don't beat this, I'm not going to go out. I'm not going to go hunting. What, you know, what am I going to do? So I went and bought another bag target. I hung it down in the basement. I bought a thumb release, started shooting that. And then I said, you know what? I'm just going to start, start doing the back tension. And I did. 
and I would just blind bail and blind bail and blind bail, shoot a hundred arrows. And I listened to a couple different podcasts and guys were talking about it. And I kind of just started following their lead and doing it. And then, so I built up my confidence. I mm-hmm. went outside and started shooting, 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 and everything just started tightening back up. Cause I got over that, that mental hurdle and I didn't have anymore. I went to the thumb, so I didn't have that whole trigger punching mechanism anymore. It was just that tension on my thumb, I squeeze the shoulder blades a little bit, pop it goes off. I didn't know when it went off, but as long as I'm floating on that target, I knew I was going to be in there. And that actually saved me. I mean, that truly saved me. That's good. That's, that's an aggressive move. I think the only thing that I've ever done more aggressively is I ended up changing strings three days, strings and cables <laughs> three days before. And so I had to really, I had to totally retune, re, I had to totally start from the ground up three days before the hunt. And, that was a nightmare. I mean, it was a nightmare. I got it done. I got it. I killed an elk that year, but I, I don't know how I got it done. But, um, yeah, I think I'm still a finger guy. I I've done thumb releases. I've done back tension. I've done all that. But when I, you know, I just was like, I, if I was to go, if I was to spend a ton of time 3d shooting and a ton of time target shooting, then I'd go back to back tension. Um, but typically, I mean, most of my time is spent hunting and I just, you know, I was with a friend of mine a few years ago. He drew up on a muley. Um, we were in the high country. He drew up on a muley, and you could see him. He's sitting there. He's pulling, 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 pulling on that back tension, pulling, 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 pulling. And that muley there's <laughs> just standing there looking at him. He's pulling, pulling. He's waiting for it to click. You know, he's waiting. And it took yep. too long. It took too long. And that deer was gone. And now he's back to – I mean, he shoots with that release – every day but when he goes hunting mule deer he grabs his finger trigger and he goes and hunts with his finger trigger um so it's a yeah knowing your equipment and not changing shit right <laughs> out of the gate is definitely something you got to do yeah. man you know or not do right so um but i think that you know um i think just selecting your arrows i mean i'm su- like i'm super anal I make sure that everything is perfect so that when I miss, I have nothing to blame but myself. Um, I mean, you know, it's, sometimes it's easy to say, oh, you know, this or oh, that, you know, this equipment, this, that, whatever. But, you know, look, if you're shooting all summer and you're in your gear and you're blind bailing and you're doing all this stuff and you're making it all work and your arrows are perfect and everything's flying right in normal situations and everything's perfect, as perfect as you can hum- humanly micro it down to then um it just makes it easier for me to accept the self-defeat when i miss which (laughs) bound to happen anyway it's just me (laughs) i gotta say these days it's a lot easier than when i I remember i first started bow hunting and uh i had an old hand-me-down bow that i got fitted to me and tuned and everything and but i mean pins were different back then you had the little plastic tips on them that would bust off all the time and there was no range finder and i i mean i picked the wrong pin and it was probably the biggest buck to this date that I missed. And it was like my first week of hunting. And it was just one of them things. Right. <laughs> Nothing you could do. Nothing you could do. Right. Well, let's talk let's talk about that a little bit, Mr. Dad with three <laughs> kids. Um that that buck you passed up a few weeks ago or whatever, you you're that's gonna haunt you. I'm just gonna tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I see you're going to have to quit being so damn choosy as a dad of three infants and a wife that yeah. you love, right? You're going to have to bring something home so that she feels you're capable and you're going to have to put some food on the table and then she's going to, she needs to see that, that what you're doing is fruitful. <laughs> and so otherwise she's going to grow resentful of your, of your scenario. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, um, so don't pass that buck up again if you see I, it. Okay? I probably won't. <laughs> I see you went looking and saw that, huh? I did bring home a doe, though. So Yeah, sir. Yeah. There you go. Sir, I mean, just circling back to the whole family thing. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, I, I've been, I was saving that zinger for you because I, I knew that, you know, to end the show, you're going to have to, you're going to, if, if your listeners might learn a lot here, but that's the one thing you're going to have to learn. <laughs> You're going to have to quit being so picky. All right. I appreciate it, man. Thanks for coming on and sharing with us. And uh, that. It's sorry. Real, Thank it's you, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's it's my pleasure. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks so much. Have yourself a good one. Right, and thank we'll talk you. again soon.
Thank you for listening to the Publicly Challenged podcast. If you like this episode, please subscribe on whatever platform it is that you're listening to. Also, you can find us on Instagram at Publicly Challenged, and you can also find us at Publicly Challenged Podcast or publiclychallenged.com. So please reach out to us with any questions, comments, concerns, or maybe you'd even like to be on the show. And once again, thank you so much for listening. Hey everyone, Will Cooper here, host of Hunt Stands Make Your Mark podcast. Join us as we dive deep into the world of hunting and outdoor pursuits. We've brought together some of the most accomplished individuals in the industry to share their invaluable insights and experiences with you. But here's the kicker. It's not just about hunting tips and tactics. We're exploring how you can carve your own path, elevate your skills, and gain some wisdom from the best in the field. So whether you're a seasoned hunter looking to fine-tune your skills or a newbie eager to learn, our podcast has something for everyone. Stay tuned for more exciting guests and hotter topics. Don't miss out and subscribe to Hunt Stand's Make Your Mark podcast today and start making your mark in the great outdoors.